Good morning. We're so very glad that you're here. Let's stand together, please, as we sing. Good morning, church, and especially those of you that are here with us in person and those that are listening on the internet. We appreciate everyone being with us this morning. I do have a couple of announcements to make to you, and the first one is that I'm not Scott Tillman. Scott Tillman is home with his new best friend, Rona, and they're having an enjoyable time for the next couple of days, but soon he will be back with us. He and his wife and Mamie, and they're all doing very well and uh, they're just having to quarantine a few more days. I want to tell you some good news. I want to give a shout out to Ralston and to Kennedy and to Harrison, our college ministers and two interns. We have a girl in our college program that most of us call Sweet Caroline. She is a dear girl. She's been with our program now in her second year. And Harrison and Ralston and Kennedy do such a good job of providing for a college program, even in the midst of a pandemic when we're distanced apart from one another. Caroline's parents sent our church a very generous contribution this week or last week, thanking them for the impact that this church has had on her. And so for that, I'm very, very grateful. Now for some sad news. Our dear sister Marge Wood passed away early this morning. She had been in a rehab center for several weeks but 36 hours, they were able to bring her home, and she was surrounded by her family for 36 hours as she passed from this life and went home to see Coach Wood. And so we're thrilled at her gaining her victory, but sad that she's left us. Also, Elizabeth Marquette's mother has had a stroke, and so Bill and Elizabeth are on the way to Atlanta right now to be with her. And last, before we continue in our worship, we want to express appreciation to Kathy Gerald for all of the years, many years of service that she has been to this church family as our full-time secretary and then served for several years as a part-time secretary. But as of January 1, Michelle Tillman will take over a full-time role as our church secretary. So now you'll know who to call and complain to <laughs> or who to call and express interest to. Just get a hold of Michelle and she'll take care of it. 
We thank you for being here. Let's continue in our worship. Will you join me in prayer this morning before we uh, begin with our reading? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. Uh, we thank you for every day that we get. We know not another single day is guaranteed. And uh, as the holiday seasons are approaching us, uh, this is a time to look, most people look forward to, time to be with family and friends and to be thankful uh, for what we have and to be thankful for your son and uh, coming to earth and his whole life that he gave. But we also know it can be a trying time for many people, especially this year with things that are going on that we may not be able to see as much family, to be around as many friends. Though some of us may have lost people close to us, this year or around this time in years past, and we know the memories that that brings up. And I pray that we as a church can be there for each other in other ways during these times, that we can continue to reach out, we can continue to be the blessing that you set this church up to be for each other. And I pray your blessing on each and every one of us here today, whether we're here in person or whether we're watching from afar, that we're all still worshiping together, we're still worshiping one in truth and one in spirit. I pray for every single person here. I pray for every single person that uh, loves the Lord, and I pray that we're able to bless those who are around us, that we take some time this holiday season to show your love to other people, to, for other things that may be going on in other people's lives. Uh, we are thankful for um, all the sacrifices that have been given uh, from those ahead of us. God, we are um, mindful of the Wood family right now and that uh, what a wonderful life Miss Wood led and the, uh, what she and her husband were meant to our church here and I pray that you be with that family during this time as well. And uh, thank you for Kathy and the many years that she spent here with this congregation. Uh, we pray her blessing moving forward and we uh, pray, pray that you continue to bless her and her family. And we uh, pray for the blessing of Michelle Tillman as she begins to step in here pretty soon. And we know that is a wonderful replacement and someone that, to carry this uh, mission on wonderfully. I pray our blessing on our service this morning, for all those who are listening all around. And we thank you for your son. We thank you for his sacrifice. Uh, as this time comes up of the Christmas season, we are thankful for uh, the birth of Christ, of what many people around the world are thinking of. Whether it's the exact time that he was born or not, this is a wonderful time to celebrate it. Here at the end of the year to reflect on what has been done, uh, to take that time out and to end it on a high note. I pray that you be with every single one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. The reading this morning uh, following the prayer is going to come from Psalm 85, uh, verses 8 through 12. It says, I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants. But let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Will you stand with me, please, as we sing our next couple of songs and engage together in our unison reading? Let's sing together.
with me? <clears throat> Excuse me, from Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Remain standing with me, please, and let's sing one more song. <clears throat> to us a child We've been blessed to live in a country where we can freely move about and to honor our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Quite frankly, this has been a challenging, difficult year on many fronts. But through all this, God is still there. God is still blessing us beyond measure. And we're thankful for that this morning. So at this time, would you bow with me as we think of our blessings and as we think about returning a portion of our gifts to him. Our most wonderful Father in heaven, we say thank you. And Father, that word seemingly sounds so empty. Except, Father, we know that the thank you that we're offering you today, we're thinking of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for what he was willing to do for us. Father, thank you for sending him. We are thankful that he was willing to leave heaven. Thank you. And Father, as we go about our daily lives, may our lives be lived in thankfulness and thank living. And Father, at this time, as we contemplate our gift to this church, to the works of your kingdom, Father, we thank you. We thank you for allowing us to be able to earn livings. We're thankful for the way you interact in our lives. And Father, as we return only a small portion of what you have blessed us with, help us do it with grateful hearts. Help us to be cheerful in our giving. Help us, Father, as we've looked inside, help us to look out and bless others. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing as it happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Sing this song, and we will also use this song to dismiss our kids to the sunshine class. Let's stand, please, and sing together.
You see the police. Today, I want to talk to you for just a moment about what does it mean that Jesus is our Prince of Peace? And I want to take you back to the Old Testament story in Judges chapter 6. It's the story of Gideon. And you remember Gideon, he is afraid of the Midianites. They appear to be more powerful, more technologically savvy, more advanced than Israel. And he's trying to understand how are we going to conquer these ones who are more powerful than we. But then God appears to him. And all of a sudden, he's not worried about the Midianites anymore. He's worried about the fact that he has seen an angel of the Lord and will he live. And God speaks to him. And God says, peace. Don't be afraid. Peace. That word in Hebrew is the word shalom. I'd love for you to say that with me, shalom. As a matter of fact, if we were in Israel today, that would be the greeting that we would give to one another. One of us would say shalom, and the other one would say shalom ra, or shalom to you as well. This word shalom is such a beautiful word. It means peace. But unfortunately, we in America have robbed the word peace of its true meaning. When we hear peace, we think peace. When we hear peace, we think the 60s, and we think the absence of conflict. But this word for peace is so much more than that. If I could use one word to describe it, it's thriving. It's the idea of I want you to thrive and you want me to thrive. We want to live in harmony with God and with each other. And so when we hear this word shalom or peace, it's this idea of the very best for you, God's very best for you. And what we discover is that this word shalom is what Gideon says describes God as Jehovah shalom. And this idea of God as peace is the peace that we have with God and also the peace that we receive from God or of God. And I wanted us to realize that this Christmas season because there is an enemy out to steal our peace. Instead of peace, the enemy wants us to have anxiety and worry and fear and contempt and frustration. Instead of appreciating people, he wants us to be frustrated with people. Instead of coming together in joy, he wants us to come together in conflict. You might have heard that there's a Christmas story that reminds us of one who's out to rob us of our peace. You might remember how that story goes because the Grinch was absolutely convinced if I just steal all the trimmings of Christmas, if there's no more trees and no more tinsel and no more presents and all of the food and the trimmings are gone, there'll be no joy and there'll be no peace. And so he steals everything and he takes it up on top of a mountain and he thinks for sure that without all the trappings of Christmas, there'll be no peace, there'll be no joy. And the people of Whoville will say, boo who. Do you remember what happens? He looks on and he watches as the people of Whoville gather without all the trimmings, the trappings of Christmas. And they remind each other again that their joy is not based upon the trimmings and their peace is not based upon their circumstances. But they have one that has given them a peace that passes understanding. And when the Grinch sees this and he realizes that there's more to Christmas than the trappings and the trimmings, the presents and the trees, he wants that joy. He wants that peace. And you might remember his heart grows three sizes that day. And I wonder if many of us don't need to ask God for our hearts to grow at least one size this Christmas. 
that we might have a greater peace and a greater joy than we've ever had before because this Christmas deserves it. And so I wanted you to notice this verse from Proverbs chapter 14. Isn't it true? A heart at peace gives life to the body. Don't you want to be someone who's at peace this Christmas? Don't you want to feel God's pleasure and to have a life that's full? Envy robs us and it rots the bones. Each time we've talked about one of these characteristics of the nature or the names of Jesus, I've tried to take us back to the Old Testament, I mean, to the, to the Revelation study that we just finished. And I wanted you to remember today from Revelation chapter 6 that the second plague that was to come upon the earth, the four horsemen, the second horse, the red horse, notice what it says in verse 4. Another horse fiery red went out and it was granted to the one who sat on it to what? To take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another and there was given to them a great sword. The evil one wants to rob us of our peace and as we looked last week in Revelation 12, this Christmas story is about the evil one wanting to steal what matters to us out of Christmas. That there's a cosmic battle going on between good and evil. And that God wants us to understand that Jesus came, that we might have a prince of peace. A prince of peace. That word prince is the word sar. Sar shalom, a prince of peace. This passage that we looked at from Isaiah chapter 9, we, you, in our unison reading, we recited it together. That he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But I wanted you to notice that this word for prince in the Hebrew is the word sar. And the word sar has its meaning coming from two words that come together. One is to wrestle or to fight, and the other one is to rule or to govern. And so this word for prince of peace is one who is going to fight for peace, one who is going to war for peace, to make sure that peace has the opportunity to win. Isn't it great to think about the fact that when you go into a challenging situation this Christmas, and let's all admit it, that Christmas is filled with challenging situations, isn't it? I mean, when we gather with our extended family, when we gather with a bunch of people, when we stay longer than Benjamin Franklin tells us to, you might remember that when about after three days, both fish and relatives begin to stink. You know, when things keep going longer than they ought and there's this sense that somebody's wanting to rob this whole situation of peace, what we know is that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's warring on behalf of peace. And so I wanted us to remember this story just very quickly of the one who came into the world to bring us peace. You might remember that for Mary and Joseph, it's not a very peaceful story. It's a story of them having to travel over 80 miles through difficult terrain from Nazareth to Bethlehem because of a census. And they go there because Mary's pledged, betrothed to be married to Joseph. And it tells us that while they were there, it became time for the baby to be born. And so Mary gave birth to a firstborn son. They wrapped him in cloth and rags and placed him in a feeding trough, a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Not the way we would think about entering into the world. Not the way we would think about our child entering into the world. But this Prince of Peace is the one who arrives at the very bottom so that this peace can be a peace that's bestowed upon all people. Don't you sometimes say that if I had more money, if I had more uh, possessions, that I'd be more peaceful? 
Isn't it interesting that the Prince of Peace came into our world at the very bottom to remind us that peace is not based upon our bank account? Peace isn't based upon the amount of things that we have in our possession. Peace is something that transforms our heart from within. And so there were shepherds in their flocks by night, uh, keeping watch of their flocks by night. These shepherds likely were those that were taking care of the sheep that would be those that would be sacrificed just eight miles away at the temple. And there they are watching over their flocks when an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And they were terrified, as we would be as well. But the angel said, do not be afraid. Same thing that was said to Gideon in Judges chapter 6. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news today of great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the King, the Christ. This will be the sign. You'll find this baby wrapped in rags and lying in a feeding trough. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared, praising God and saying, and can you say this with me? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those with whom God's favor rests. Now look at the person next to you and ask them, does God's favor rest upon you? Does it? Weren't the angels announcing that today something has happened? God has favored you. God has given you the opportunity to thrive in the things that matter. God has given you his harmony. God has given you his peace. God has given you this opportunity to look at the challenges that are all around us, the chaos, the virus, the election, the economy, the world, and to say in the midst of it all, in all the conflict, in all of the disruption, to say God's favor has rested upon me. God has entered into this world and he's entered into it at the very bottom so that I can know that this peace is available to me. And so the angels couldn't believe what God had done. And so they said, let's go in and see this thing. And they come and they see Mary and the baby and they go off to tell everyone they can find about what God has done to break into our world. This Prince of Peace, this Sar Shalom, this Prince who wars for peace did give us some teaching about peace. You might remember in chapters John, uh, 14 through 16 of John, we discover that Jesus is speaking about the Holy Spirit. And for the original disciples, it may have sounded like it looks on this screen. They heard a lot of words they weren't quite sure they understood. But there were some that they heard that they did understand. Something about the Holy Spirit, a gift from the Father. Something about peace. But there were two verses there I want to point out to you particularly. From John chapter 14, Jesus says, My thriving peace, my harmony with God, I leave with you. At the end of John, before he goes to the Father, Jesus breathes upon his apostles and says, Peace be with you. My thriving harmony with God, peace, I'm leaving it with you. The peace that has controlled my life, that has allowed me to be the non-anxious presence in every room, the one that has allowed me not to get caught up in possessions or to chase after things that really don't matter, I'm leaving that peace with you. I'm giving it to you. I don't give cheap imitation like the world gives. So, it's up to you 
You get to decide this. Do not let your heart be troubled. And don't be afraid. When you're tempted to let your heart be troubled and to be afraid, remember this gift that I'm giving to you. And two chapters later, he says, there's a time that's coming, in fact, has come when you'll be scattered each to your own home. We kind of feel that way today, don't we? There's a little scattering, a little quarantine, a little isolation. Jesus is talking about what happened after Good Friday and on Saturday. But he says, you will leave me alone, yet I won't be alone. The Father is always with me. And the good news to everyone who's watching us from home today is that you are not alone. If you look in the chair that might be sitting there next to you, Jesus promises that he will be with us, especially when we gather. And so Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you might have shalom. In this world, you will have what? Trouble. With a capital T, trouble. But be of heart. I have overcome the world, and because I have, you can too. So if the Prince of Peace is going to control our will and control our Christmas, here's a few thoughts for you. The Prince of Peace is warring today that you might have peace. The peace that comes from having Jesus as your Savior, has taking him as your Lord. It's the peace that we have with God and the peace of God. If you're not feeling that peace today, you can ask God for it. Look what it says in 2 Thessalonians 3. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you. Pray and ask God for peace. Before you walk into the family dinner that you know that uncle who always picks on you is going to be there, you say, God, grant me your peace. When you're feeling alone and your family's not gathering for Christmas this year, God, grant me this peace. This peace that's available in every circumstance because the Lord is with you. Or notice what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4. He says, let your gentleness be known to all. The Lord is really close. He's near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and guard your mind in Jesus Christ. Ask God to give you peace. The second thing, do a heart check. Do a heart check and ask yourself, is my heart at peace? One of the things that happens to many of us during the holidays is we get amped up. I mean, we get really worked up and we don't even realize it. We're like Martha in the kitchen and not like Mary in the living room. I mean, we are worked up because Christmas has to be just this way. Well, it's not going to be that way this year. Peace. Let's check our hearts. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. And Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. That word for peacemaker is hurlers of peace. People who go around tossing peace into situations that look like conflict. Jesus says you're blessed when you arrive and you bring peace with you. That's when you are a child of God. So pray for peace. Give yourself a heart check. Be a person of peace. And number three, give your home a home check. Proverbs 17 says, 
better to have a Christmas with dry crust and peace and quiet than to have a house that's full of feasting but strife. Isn't that true? Make sure that your Christmas is known this year as being a home that's filled with peace. I urge you, first of all, that prayers, intercessions, and petitions, thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in authority. Why? That we might live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness, for this is good. The path to peace this holiday, whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. Watch what you say this holiday season. Don't say it. Just be quiet. And when you're tempted to gossip, don't do it. Be quiet. When you're tempted to walk out of the room and go find somebody that you know is going to take your side, peace. Just let it go. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Be active in chasing after peace this holiday season. I saw this painting by Reuben, The Adoration of the Magi, and all I want you to know is I didn't like it. I don't know if you do, but I looked at it and I was like, that's the most non-peaceful situation I can imagine. You know, it just looks like there's chaos everywhere in this picture except right there where the Christ child is. And I show you this picture only to say that you may be feeling like your world is swirling. It's out of control. It's more than you could have imagined. Let the Prince of Peace take over the situation, take over the picture, and ask that he might grant you peace this holiday. There's a prayer that we can all pray, and that is, God, this Christmas season, let the Prince of Peace be the Lord of our home. Let him be the Lord of our Christmas. And you might even want to say, these words, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. There is a tiny warrior warring for your peace this Christmas. He is your wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. He offers you peace with God through his death on the cross, through your baptism, through your acceptance of him as your Lord and Savior, you have peace. Through God's spirit that resides in you as a gift of God, you have the peace of God. And you now, as one who follows the Prince of Peace, will be sent out into a world to be peace for God this Christmas. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. And if, I, if we can help you in any way, if you're subject to the call of Christ, however we can minister to you, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing this song together. <clears throat>
Let's sing one more song as we prepare our hearts and our minds for communion this morning. This morning, our reading for our communion is going to be coming from Colossians 1, verse 19 through 20. Before I read, I want to first uh, just kind of tell you, this is a letter from Paul to the church. First of all, commending them for their love and for the faith that they have. And second of all, for encouraging them in trying times such as we have, more similar to like we have, encouraging them to be strong in the faith, encouraging them to continue to love each other, and also reminding them that the world was made through Christ and for Christ. So as this time of year, as we choose this time to be thankful for the gifts we have, for the sacrifice that, God, that Christ made for us, and as we also give gifts to each other, let us ultimately remember and be thankful for the ultimate gift that was given to us. Let's read. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Bow with me now as we thank God for the bread as it represents the body that was broken on the cross for our sins. Lord, we come to you this morning so thankful for your grace, for your love, and for the peace that you give us. We thank you ultimately for your son for that sacrifice that was made for us. At this time, as we partake of this bread, we ask you to help us to remember that sacrifice, help us to be appreciative of it, and help us to accept that gift so that we can in one day live eternity with you in ultimate peace. In Christ's name, amen.
Now as we think about the blood that was shed, let's pray again. Lord, again, we thank you so much for all that we have and all that you are. Lord, we pray that as we drink this fruit to the vine, that we remember the blood that was shed and how it cleanses us of our sins and makes us right in your eyes again. We thank you so much for that opportunity, for that gift. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. God, I want to thank you so much for that message this morning. You used the line, when you're together with your family during Christmas and you think it, don't say it. My wife put my arm around me and drew me close to her and whispered in my ear, are you listening? <laughs> I want to make one more announcement to you this morning. Early in the pandemic, we went virtual for all of our services and we tried to maintain a virtual presence. We added a Wednesday night class. We have a call-in Sunday evening worship that Denny and Cole do. But at this time right now, cases in Davidson County have climbed exponentially. There are over 7,000 active cases in Davidson County. We have more of our members either active, COVID, positive, or in quarantine because of um, contact tracing with COVID. And so the elders have made the decision that after today, we're going to go virtual again for hopefully just a couple of weeks, and we're going to stay in constant contact with you, but we'll still maintain our virtual presence, and we appreciate so much Russ and all of his team and what they've done for us, and we're going to maintain that not only Sunday morning, but also Wednesday night in our Sunday evening call-in service, and we'll try to stay in contact with you as best we can. Make sure you're watching the Wednesday and the Friday email blasts that give all of the information. We hope to be back together again very soon. But as you leave today, make sure you pick up a few of the communion kits so you have those at home so that we can participate, even though it's virtually, we can participate in the Lord's Supper together. I'm going to ask you to bow with me as we pray. Pray for these decisions. Pray for our family that has COVID and pray for uh, an end to this pandemic. Father in heaven, you have been so good to us. And we love to hear the scriptures where you call us to peace because your son is the Prince of Peace. But we're concerned right now, Father, with the increase in COVID cases in our county. And uh, Father, we hope that we're making the best decision for our church family. We're concerned about every person here. And we know we have people in our church that are COVID positive. We know that we have people that are quarantining right now because of contact with people that are COVID positive. And first, we want to pray for each one of those people and ask that their symptoms are mild like so many have had recently. And we uh, ask that you care for them and get them well as soon as possible. Father, we also pray for our leaders that have brought a vaccine into our nation in really, really record time. And so, Father, we hope that through mitigation efforts, and through keeping ourselves away from large groups and through the positive effects of this vaccine, the cases will come under control very quickly because, Father, as your church family, we want to be together. So, Father, thank you for every opportunity you give us. Bless us to be well and healthy. Bless us and help us to look out, especially for our fellow man during this season of giving. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. I want to add my thanks to Scott for an incredible lesson. I know, I know that's the message that I needed to hear, and I have a feeling that we can all say, uh, say the same. And I also want to uh, say that I'm glad Don acknowledged Russ and his team for the incredible work that they do. Uh, as we go back virtual for a couple of weeks, what an incredible blessing it is that we can do that in confidence, we can do that in excellence, 
uh, because of all that Russ and his team bring to us. So please be sure and thank him. Uh, what a blessing it is to have excellence in our AV. Thank you, guys. We are a blessed people. We're going to stand and sing Silent Night. I'm going to ask that we stay together and sing all three verses, and then Don will dismiss you as we repeat the first verse in just a moment. So let's stand and sing this together, and then you'll be dismissed. Questions. A few weeks ago, I talked about those aha moments. One, when Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say I am? Then making the question a bit more personal, he asked, who do you say I am? Hello, friends and family. I'm Ronnie Ferris, an elder at the Church of Christ in Green Hills. We're glad you joined us today. Recently, I read an article entitled, Why Did Jesus Ask So Many Questions? Come to think of it, I'd never considered this before. Yes, Jesus did ask many questions, but why? His reasons may help us when we're talking to others about Jesus Christ. So, why all the questions? One, it was a way of engagement with one he might otherwise never have spoken to. He created a conversation. Questions forced thinking on the part of an individual or a group. Questions can build relationships. And also, to get the real conversation that Jesus wanted to have with that person or individual. Let's reflect on some particular conversations Jesus had. To the Samaritan woman, will you give me a drink of water? And we saw where that led. Here's another one. 
Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and ignore the log in your own eye? When in conversation with his disciples, they ask, how are we going to feed this crowd? And Jesus answers with a question, how many loaves do you have? He's saying to them, look at your resources and imagine the possibilities. When asked about inheriting eternal life in Luke 10, verses 25 through 28, Jesus let the man answer the question, wholeheartedly love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The question produced the correct answer. Jesus said, do this and live. When confronted with the question of who is my neighbor, Jesus told the parable of a man who fell among robbers. Jesus asked the question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor? The point of the parable was the given answer by the law expert, the one who had mercy. That's found in Luke 10 verses 36 and 37. So since Jesus asked questions, perhaps we should take our cue from him and ask questions of others. Our questions may help us lead them to Christ. Questions can be conversation starters and they can help us create deeper relationships with others. Questions will help us and others think more deeply or perhaps in a challenging direction. Questions help bring about a commitment or a change in one's life direction. An example of a question that leads to a life-changing moment is this. My older brother Barry tells of an encounter with a man. His family members were disciples of Jesus. He was a good man, but he wasn't a baptized believer of Christ. He had gone to church for many years and had heard many gospel messages, but he had never given his life to Jesus. In her concern, his wife asked my brother if he would speak to her husband, and he did so without hesitation. Barry asked the man why he had not been baptized into Christ. The surprising answer came back, no one ever asked me if I would. Like me, you're thinking, what? Yes, he had heard dozens, if not hundreds, of gospel messages and invitations. However, the point was that no one had personally asked him to commit his life to Jesus. No one had asked him why he had never been immersed. The answer produced a happy outcome. The man was immediately baptized. The power of a question, the ask. Jesus asked questions for many reasons. We too can ask those eternity changing questions as well. If we don't ask, then who will? What questions are you asking? Would you like to contact us? You may at elders at cocgh.org. We're here for you. We're here to help you with those life-changing, even eternity-changing questions.